N. N. Teller Foolis was first broadcast as a 90-minute television special in the UK on ITV in 2010. Based on the success of the first special, the following year they taped eight episodes in the summer in London. Andrew Golder and Pete Golden have executive produced the shows from the start in the UK. Lincoln Hyatt joined the show in the US during the first season in 2014 when the CW Network reached out to buy the ITV Penn & Teller Foolish shows. Based on the success of that rebroadcast in 2015, they began taping seasons of the show from the Penn & Teller showroom at the Rio Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. They are currently broadcasting the eighth season Remarkably, they have managed to keep the show on schedule and have broadcast a series in the midst of a global pandemic. Now that's magic. Foolus are currently casting for season nine, and I'll provide more information about that later. I am thrilled to speak with Andrew and Lincoln today to learn more about their successes, their struggles, and their challenges. Can you please tell the viewers a little bit about your experience and what magic exposure you had pre Penn and Teller? Uh, pre pre Penn and Teller, we were merely fans of magic uh, and audience members at Penn and Teller shows and others. Uh, and then I uh, worked with Penn on a game show for NBC called Identity. Penn hosted, and uh, that began our working and friendship relationship and a couple years later out of that uh came fool us and sort of the rest is history we are you know television producers and creators first and magic producers second but 10 years later um uh we're fairly fairly well versed in magic as one magician said to us uh we know just enough to be dangerous yeah you have a trick or two up your sleeve <laughs> Yeah, well, a Andrew doesn't know this, but I actually had a background in magic before we started doing this together. I had a little plastic box that could make a dime vanish or could make a nickel turn into a quarter. And I was absolutely fascinated with it. And I, and I demonstrated my trick all the time. And I thought that if I just tried hard enough, I could read people's minds. So I was constantly looking for opportunities to prove to anybody around me that I could read their mind. I don't know if that qualifies as a magic background, but it was an early fascination in a very limited scope. And since you've been with Penn & Teller, have you expanded that? The, the, the knowledge, the fascination, or the love of magic? Uh, the, the fascination and your abilities to read minds. <laughs> well, it's actually a producing skill. You have diverse um, responsibilities. Uh, it's quite interesting, uh, the little bit I've learned about it. Can you just walk the viewers through your 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 individual responsibilities, executive producing the Penn and Teller show? I think there's really a lot of overlap actually uh, between what we do. I mean, we are uh, involved in watching, finding, casting um, everybody. And then we work with those acts to sort of uh, share with them what we've learned about what makes a good act for Fool Us. Um, which, you know, we've sort of, in breaking it down and giving it a lot of thought um, and working with performers, you know, what works for a stage audience or a parlor audience um, is different from what works on TV. The attention span is shorter, every word and every action counts a little bit more than in a theater show where you've got an audience that's a captive audience without their phones sitting there just looking at you for 30 minutes to an hour, uh, as opposed to someone who's on their couch with God knows what distractions. So um, we try and work with them to, to focus their act. You're like a politician. You have leapt ahead to the question you wanted to answer and completely sm smoothed over and bypassed Connie's actual question. No, no, that's part of that's the it. answer. Just that we, we work <laughs> with the acts. We work with the We cast the acts. We work with the acts. We uh, watch uh, a lot of magic. We have expanded to sort of traveling 
uh, around the world when one could travel around the world. And now we do it via Zoom and whatnot, but to sort of find, you know, our mission is to bring the best magic in the world to the show. And then once we've cast the acts, each act gets their own unique uh, backdrop. So we deal with that during the show. Obviously, we're, we're dealing with Penn and Teller and, and working with them. Their acts, Lincoln sort of works more with Allison and I work more with Penn and Teller in terms of, you know, I'm, I'm listening to them along with Mike Close to sort of make that judgment of whether they've been fooled or not. And, um, and I'm, I'm working with Allison on the, her live interviews. I'm coordinating some of the tech behind the scenes, usually related to graphics and playback. Mm -hmm. um, it's mostly, I mean, our, our working relationship and our friendship goes back 25 years or more, 30, yeah. 30 years now. Yeah. Um, I forgot to add the last five. <laughs> so we also, we also have a lot of shorthand and we, we know each other's tastes. Right. Um, we backstop each other. Um, it's, a, it's a just, I mean, I don't think it would be possible to produce the show the way we do if we didn't have the working relationship we have and the history we have. Largely on creative topics, it's we rely on each other and we share a great, great deal. Right. Yeah. You, you trust each other and, and you can sort of read each other's minds. There you go. There you go. It all, com all comes back to mind reading. Exactly. Right? Just going back to something you said, Andrew, for the viewers. So it's you and um, Michael Close that actually are determining if the act has fooled Penn and Teller? Yeah, while uh, Allison is interviewing the act, uh, Penn and Teller are sort of having a no holds barred, very, uh, you know, with, with, with no code at all, uh, conversation about how they think the trick was done. And Mike and I uh, are listening to that and basically making, in, in most cases, I mean, that, that allows us to understand whether they understand the trick or not. And obviously that's a conversation that we want no one to hear because they're talking real, literally how the trick is done. And then we try and, uh, you know, then Penn has to uh, boil that down to a, a short, concise, coded uh, statement of what they think the key elements of the method are. Um, and possibly a gift that no other magician or talent on the earth can do is to speak as well on the fly and synthesize a bunch of information and make it entertaining every time. Right. Yeah, no, I agree. It's, it's, it's remarkable. And the code words that he uses, it's, it's just beautifully done. Yeah. And, and also, um, I can imagine over time that it's a skill that everybody's honed, but that he's also honed. Yep, you are correct. And obviously that process of them, you know, the, an interview on air lasts roughly a minute. Uh, we shoot a longer interview and then edit that down to key sound bites and give Penn and Teller a little more time off camera to sort of lay out the mechanics of a trick. You know, sometimes Teller, generally it would be Teller, Occasionally it's pen, but some, you know, they, they start guessing as soon as they see a prop loaded on the stage, <laughs> they'll start talking before they've even seen the act They're, They'll start, you know, they have, they, they take it seriously in a good way. You know, it's, it's, they have fun with this sort of, uh, the, the competition. They're, they're in a candy shop when a, something new comes on stage that they haven't seen before. And am I correct in saying that they have no knowledge whatsoever of the artists that are going to be performing? You are 100% correct in that. It is one of those things that people sometimes, you know, this online skeptics sometimes don't believe that that's the case. Mm -hmm. But indeed, the first time they find out who's going to be on a stage is when they step on the stage. The, the only way they'd know is if one of the artists themselves spilled the beans because it would never come from production. Right. So there's a little bit of a risk with uh, internet and social network and all that, that information can get out there, but they're not seeking it. They're not looking for it. They don't want it. They want to play the game pure. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's interesting that this is actually a game and both of you have um, a lot of experience in game shows. And I, I didn't put two and two in together until I did a little bit of research um, because yeah. I was going to be speaking with you. And yeah. it's really fascinating that you have approached this as it's a game like a game show as opposed to a talent show. Correct. 
And, and, and really, I mean, for, it first and foremost is, is a magic show. As we say to all the acts, it is a show, you know, at its core by magicians for magicians. Um, and, and we, while, while that competition or game part of it is part of what makes it different than just a straight ahead magic show, and we certainly embrace that, it's, it's not the focus, really. It, the focus of the show and the reason for the show to exist is to create a showcase for the best magic in the world. Penn and Teller love nothing more. They are probably most happy when an act completely fools them. And they, they get to have that uh, one sense of wonderment that they had when they before they really got into magic and they were just interested in it. And for them to... Uh, be fooled is is a great pleasure. I hope you enjoyed this talk as much as I did. If you haven't already, please subscribe and hit the notifications bell. Oh, and please comment. We love to hear from you and to receive feedback so we can grow and improve the Magical Women channel and project. Ciao for now. I'm Connie Boyd. And I very much look forward to hearing from you.